Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca Connors, my pronouns are she, her, and I am one of the co-directors of the Notebooks Collective. We are a virtual literary arts space focused on community connection and continued learning. The Notebooks Collective believes that Black Lives Matter and acknowledges that as a virtual organization, our offices are on the, on the lands of the Kickapoo, Massachusetts, and Pawtucket tribes. Native peoples across the world continue to preserve and celebrate their cultures, and we encourage you to support Native writers and artists. We know these are stressful times, and we are always glad you have joined with us tonight to celebrate community. I will now welcome Lisa to introduce our presenters. Let's try that again when I'm not muted. Hi, everyone. My name is Lisa Allen. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm one of the co-directors of the Notebooks Collective. We are so grateful that you have joined us tonight for this In Conversation with Trisha Bogle and Shu Tu. I'm going to cop to something before we go any further. I am a huge fan of Trish Bogle's poetry. Her poetic voice is so different from mine, and yet I find something so relatable, so human in its quiet ferocity. I also consider Trish a dear friend and count myself lucky to be able to say that. I tell you this because to not tell you this would feel like I was holding something back. And that's the antithesis of poetry, isn't it? Even when poets aren't saying something blatantly, even when it seems like maybe they're not talking about you, the thing that you think they're talking about, the poets that I love most leave it all there on the page. The beauty, the shine, the underbelly, the fear. But this in conversation isn't just with Trish. It is equally with Shu Tu, an artist whose digital paintings evoke nature and light, grief and celebration. I am a huge fan of Shu's work as well, even though it's newer to me than Trisha's poems. Shu does something with color and composition that I can't quite explain, except to say that it produces an instant calm for me, but also in knowing that there is something else there just under the surface that she sees, but I don't. It keeps me looking at her art, trying to parse a mushroom or a fork or a flower in the same way I would try to parse a line break or a word choice. Her art makes me smile as much as it makes me think, and I believe there's power in that combination. This event, as we mentioned earlier, is new for us at the Notebooks Collective. We've never hosted an artist before. We're doing so tonight because Shu and Trish have collaborated on an exhibit that's currently on display at the Hamilton Grange Library in New York City, and it will be for the rest of the week, so if you're here in New York City, you should go see it. It's titled, In a Garden of Small Dreams, Art and Poetry in Conversation. The exhibit is a study in collaboration, concision, and compromise in the best way possible. It's also about the blossoming of a friendship that started with a shared love of, well, gardens and art and the words and worlds we can enter when we speak to each other through art, through poetry, through the beauty and the shine of life, the fear and the underbelly of the darkness we all sometimes feel. As individual creatives, Trish and Shu are accomplished, focused, fiercely loyal to their respective crafts. As collaborators, they learned to speak yet another language, one in which they learned to listen to and see each other, not just as friends, but as artists with something to say. Together, they said those things in a way that they may not have had they not accepted an invitation from Isaac Sorrell at Hamilton Grange Library to display their work as an ekphrastic exhibit. And this is why we're here, to talk about the genesis of this collaboration how they worked together, what they learned from one another, and how their friendship changed or didn't through the process. They'll let us know tonight. I'm gonna read their official bios now, and I'm gonna to try to move a little quicker. Poet Trisha Bogle, Trish, has called New York City home since 1991. She holds a BA in creative writing and philosophy from Loyola, Baltimore, and an MA and PhD in political theory and philosophy from Fordham University. 
For more than two decades, she taught advanced courses in writing, philosophy, bioethics, political science, and great books at various institutions, including Montclair State University, Stevens Institute of Technology, Fordham University, and the Johns Hopkins University CTY program. In recent years, she has expanded her work as a poet, exploring many of the same themes through poetry that engaged her for decades as an academic philosopher. Trish currently lives and writes in Washington Heights. It can often be spotted in Highbridge Park, watching the sunrise over the Bronx while sipping cafe con leche and reading translations of Basho out loud to the trees. Trisha's poem, Ideation, was just published in Digging Press a few days ago. We would love for you to go check that out. In June, Pine Robe Press published two of her poems and gave her featured poet status to open their June 2023 issue. Bronx 1995 was published by Chautauqua Literary Journal this past spring, and other credits include the South Dakota Review, Passengers Journal, and Kajibi. Artist Shu Tu has earned her Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the Parsons School of Design and studied fashion accessories at, at the Cordwainers London College of Fashion. For over 25 years, she held positions as a creative director and leader in the advertising and beauty industries. In recent years, she has expanded her work as an artist. This journey has enabled her to produce deeply personal work that communicates her story through multiple mediums, including traditional and digital art, floral arrangement, ceramics, and metalsmithing. She currently resides in Upper Manhattan. You might often spot her in the company of her children, Ander and Percy, engaging in the silliest conversations and sharing the wildest laughter. Shu has two solo exhibitions currently on view in New York City. One, titled Vases 2, is at Chalk, New York City. The second, Shu 2 and Cafe Bloom, is at Cafe Bloom in Washington Heights. Shu also has another solo exhibition coming up at the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum next month, and you can learn more about that on their website. Both artists would like you to know that the exhibition at Hamilton Grange Library runs through closing on Thursday, September 14th. And now I want to welcome Trish and Shu. Hi. Hi. Hi, Shu. Hello, ladies. <laughs> so good to see you. You know, Lisa, I should we should say Shu and I um, in Upper Manhattan here, we're on Lenape land. So oh, that you. is represented as well. Um, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, that reminds me, we should we should put that in for all of our presenters. I don't know that we have in the past. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Um, I want to start with some general questions for both of you. Um, because we're talking about collaboration, right? So I'd kind of like to hear the story of how the two of you met, um, how the idea for the exhibit came to be. And Trish, if you could really quickly just tell people what ekphrasis is in case someone here doesn't already know what that means. Oh, of course. Yeah. So if there's anybody who doesn't know what ekphrasis means, it's actually a fairly ancient tradition for poets to write poems that have been inspired by works of art. Um, so the, a, a good famous example would be Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn. You know, you see a piece of art, you love it, you write a poem. Uh, so that's the simplest, uh, the simplest view of ekphrasis. Um, and I'm grateful to Shu because she turned it around on me. <laughs> she thought if poets have been doing this for all this time, artists ought to start paying poets back <laughs> a little bit. I love that. Can you talk a little bit about how you met? How I mentioned your shared love of gardens, but um, just for the people who are here tonight, can you talk about your, you know, your initial meeting and how you came to to think that you could do this collaboration together? Trish, should I take this one? You should take this one, Shu. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so let me share the story of Trish Shu. So Trish and I used to live in the same apartment building in Upper Manhattan. So we crossed paths when we both volunteered to care for the gardens in our building. Um, but our connection actually didn't really happen until two years ago, right, Trish? Um, so yeah. I actually was on my way moving out of the apartment after living in after living there for over a decade. And one day, Trish and I had this like spontaneous idea. 
just take a walk to Fort Tryon Park to look at the flowers in the garden, right? <laughs> and um, and then that's when everything changed. You know, in that walk, we chatted nonstop for a solid two hours. Um, I said that it was it was such a like the weirdest sensation that it felt like we were like reunited with a long lost friend. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so Trish and I talked about, I think that at that time we both were going through a period of growth in our lives, mm -hmm. um, reconnecting with things that we're both passionate about. Uh, for Trish, that was poetry. And for me, um, it was creating personal art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I couldn't believe that Shu had been living right under my nose. Mm -hmm. And then we've been passing each other quietly in the elevator like New Yorkers do, um, not really saying much more than, hello, it's very rainy outside today. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, so for, for 10 years, this is what we this is what we shared. And then this one day we opened up and I remember she she said, well, could I show you something on my phone? It's a little piece of digital art that I'm working on. And I was, I was blown away. I was blown away. So um, that's how, that's how it started. That leads right into my next question, which is what was it about each other's mutual creativity or, or works of art that made you want to work together? Cause you know, we all meet we all meet different people who are doing creative things, but there's not always that um, synergy between two people that make them want to work together, right? So what was it that that each of you saw in the other that said, you know, I'd really love to do this? Um, I think that the maybe the, the subject matter, for me, Trisha's choice of subject matter is very intriguing to me, is very much aligned with a topic that it personally interests me such as growth loss and for me I would say the complex relationship between parents and children yeah. um, and whenever when I look into Trish's piece I actually see her in every one of her work um, for me I see they're very honest very raw um, they embody so much pain but it's yet so beautiful so um yeah. Yeah, so that's that's from yeah. me. <laughs> I, I saw the same thing in in Shu's artwork too. There was I I noticed in in the pieces that she was showing me, there were words hidden in them, um, and the pieces had this very surface beautiful quality to them. They're so lush, and you know everybody on this call will get to see a few of them and just see how how lush and beautiful and vibrant they are. Um, but there are these words under that were underneath the, the pieces that she showed me originally, and they were kind of hidden. Um, and when I asked her about those words, like that was like the sadness, the difficulties were kind of covered up by by beauty. And I thought, ah, oh, that's something that we we try to do, or we try to um, transform the the sad and the painful and the difficult moments of life into something beautiful. But that doesn't mean that the sadness isn't there. Mm. Under so we were definitely we were doing we were doing the same thing um but with different mediums yeah. i love how trish describes my work <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to hear it from other people though isn't it because yes <laughs> with other words um i think this is a great time to if becca you could put face uh facing the art for facing me up on the screen and trish um, once that's up, maybe you could read Facing Me. Absolutely. Okay. So let me find Facing Me. Okay. So this is, this is for you, Shu. <laughs> facing Me. On a day like this, sky empty, sun bright, your face becomes a smear of light in the meadow like a plant quietly reverting to something more original and true, blurred and blind, seeking its origins, runner below ground, deciding in darkness, in its rhizome, to change color, leave variegation behind for something safer, greener, more pure and solid, so that when leaves sprout forth and face the sun, 
they pull it in, drink its light, all borders erased. This is how we forget the shape of loved ones' faces when they die, struggling to remember because there are too many versions to hold steady. They run together, edges softening in the lamp of memory, like this field, these flowers, this face, which is your face, my child, facing me, waiting only to become what it will be. That was so beautiful. I'm curious if you could each take us through, what was it like trying to work with each other's respective creative expressions for the first time? Because this was the first one, right? The I will say, so everything, everything that we do comes from shoes, courage, and bravery. So we were, um, you know, when we were walking, I, I, I asked you if she knew what a crisis was, and she said, "No, I don't." I, I, so I told her, I told her what it was, and she immediately was like, "But we should do a trade." And I was like, "What do you mean a trade? You know, you give me a piece of art, and I will write about it. That's how a crisis works, and not when you're working with Shu." <laughs> she said, "No." Here's here's what we should do. Let's trade a piece. You give me a poem. I'll give you a, a piece of work that I've done. And in a week, we'll get back to each other. You write something. I will create something visual. Um, and this is what she gave me. She gave me Facing Me. And as a poet, I was, I was actually terrified because I thought a week was not nearly enough time. So she, she um, really encourages me to move much faster, <laughs> you know, move fast, keep, keep going, be, be courageous. Don't, don't sit and keep it. Um, so to make facing, to make this particular poem, I, um, I was very afraid of disappointing Shu. Um, and I sat with it for a couple of days without actually writing anything. I just really wanted to think about the piece. And of course, you know, I noticed what I'm sure it was up, it was up on the screen. So you all saw what I saw, this blurred face. Um, and as the days went by, I remembered something that my grandmother had said to me. My grandmother's an artist and she had said, children are very difficult to do paintings of because they haven't lived enough. Life isn't in their faces yet. And you need life in a face lived to, to that something to capture. So I thought about that and I thought, I wonder if, if there's something going on there. And then the next day, I was thinking about my own grief and you know, some things I've lost some people recently. And one of the things that grieving people often report feeling or fearing is that they will forget the face of this person who they who they loved and the reason that you worry about forgetting is the opposite reason of children it's because they've lived so much especially if you've known them through a whole arc of their life um you know too many versions of them so when you try to remember a face, it becomes difficult. So I knew that I wanted to combine these two concepts in the poem, uh, but I didn't. I didn't know how, and I kept going back to just the image itself, the the plants that were there, the 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 blur, the the brightness, um, and it came to me when I was walking in a park. I was like, well, it's about. I can make plants <laughs> the the hook to this. You know, it's it's the outdoors, it's nature is what's going to tie these these concepts together. Um, and I, I wrote the poem and I shared it with Shu on a much faster time frame than I normally write. Um, I normally do not write this this fast. Um, I mean, you you know, there's a there's a poem in this exhibit called Bronx 1995, right? So it's <laughs> 
<laughs> 23. So I usually work on a much longer time frame. Um, so I gave it to Shu, and I was very worried about what she would think that she gave me this, this, this beautiful piece of art that featured her daughter. And I wrote a poem about death <laughs> or that included that concept. Um, so what I've got for you on that. I don't know. Shu, what do you um, Okay, so I want to I want to actually take everyone through, um, like the reaction how I actually received it. Um, Becky, can you put up the visual again? Because I do want to talk about a little about the visual, and then, um, I think that is a really nice leeway to um, what Trisha just talked about. Okay, Not this one um, should be facing me. There you this go. One. Okay. But I actually also see your um entire desktop, just so you know. Yeah, we can. Okay. Let me start talking. So most of my work has really revolved around capturing the everyday beauty. So this image actually is quite personal to me. So it came on a very simple, ordinary day when my daughter was extremely happy and content. Um, so it began the story of she is like craving for watermelons. Um, so one early morning, we hopped on our little wagon. Keep in mind, we're in New York. We don't have a car to get this watermelon. So on the way back, we were passing this garden. And then the garden was in full bloom This with this explosion of colors. And she was standing in front of it, looking so happy and content. And I told myself that. Um, I need to capture this moment. So this is the little bit background of the story. Um, so when I um, received Trish's poem, um, I was very touched um, because it expanded my love for my daughter into a much broader and deeper meaning. Um, and another thing that I that struck me was that People often ask me, Shu, like, why don't you add facial features, to, like features to your faces? Um, and I couldn't really quite put my finger on it. Um, it just didn't feel right to me. So, um, so after reading Trisha's poem, it gives me the words to explain why. Uh, because there are too many versions to be hold, hold steady. So it was quite of a surreal moment for me that I love how her words helped me articulate something that I I felt but I couldn't express. Mm. That's really interesting. The whole um, yeah, how we get to see things differently just because of someone else's perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should read uh, Silver next. So Becca, can you put Silver up? There we go. And then Trish, if you want to go ahead and read that one. Yeah, I will. So this is so this is the poem that I gave to Shu that day to, to work with when she said, let's do a trade. So I gave her this poem, Silver, um, to uh to create a piece of work for. So silver. When she was a young woman and still had choices. This is what she chose, this silver, before the wedding, before it was too late, modern, brushed, wand-like, something like snowfall, before it was too late, this is what she chose. And it still wasn't too late. The vows hadn't come, the children hadn't come. Each dawn mist still rose without judgment. Choosing this, I choose again what she chose when she still had choices about beautiful things. I trace the curves, the brushing, leaves like wheat or corn stalks, silky. In choosing as she did, in choosing to hold, to eat, with this fork, this spoon, do I choose her? I choose 
the beautiful parts of her, the part that could once hold a beautiful thing and say, I choose this. Thanks, guys. Oh, <laughs> thank you. That's so beautiful. I, I didn't do a good job of leading into that, of letting people know that your exchanges were not were not always one way, right? Sometimes Trish, you saw a work of art first, and sometimes Shu, you created art from mm -hmm. a poem. So that's a little bit different than the, than just straight ekphrasis, right? It took it to yeah. a more collaborative. And I, I should say this, this was Shu and I told her what a crisis was and said I was, I might like to write a poem about her art. Um, she really, she insisted that we trade, that this should, that a crisis should not be one way. Um, and that was a new idea to, to me as a, as a poet that let's make this a, a two way street that all came from Shu. Um, and we gave each other these pieces blind. So she gave me facing me. I had no idea what piece she was going to choose and I would have to write something about it. And I did the same thing to her with silver. I just emailed her silver and said, see you in a week. <laughs> Good luck. Um, so I, I'd actually love to know how you made this shoe. <laughs> um, okay. So this is actually more our first collaboration. Um, so Trish hand me this poem without any background or context. Um, so honestly, I didn't know quite, you know, what to expect. I was like, would she prefer something abstract or a literal interpretation of the poem? What's her artistic style like? What is it? So I decided to strive the balance between all these possibilities. <laughs> um, so I kind of held on to it for, so, for a couple of days. And so I was thinking about it before I was drifting off to sleep and hoping my unconscious, hoping my unconscious, like subconscious, will give me some visual inspiration to our sign. Um, that didn't work. So, <laughs> so anyway, so one day during like a super early morning, I was walking by the lake and I kind of gaze, gaze over the sky and water. And I was like, oh, I, I, I think I know what I want to do. So I choose a line. Each dawn, the mist um, still rose without judgment, has a foundation um, to incorporate, to, has a foundation. And then I incorporate visual elements into these scenes. If you look closely, you can see um, the mountain transform into the shape of woman's face and the mist or cloud uh, resemble a fork and a spoon from the poem. So it all, all kind of come together in this like misty dreamlike feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was yeah. my interpretation. Yeah. And then she and then she gave this to me. I should say something, so I'll tell a secret that I haven't told Shu or you or any anybody else about this about this poem, the genesis of this poem. Um, so the silver pattern, I mean, obviously this poem is about uh, silver pattern. Um, the name of the pattern was Dawn Mist. And I wanted to include as a little, well, I guess it's not gonna be a secret now. I wanted it to be a secret for myself that I like a little secret treat for me inside the poem, a little egg for myself um, that I would know that this was the that this was the name of that pattern that um, that in fact my my mother had had chosen when she was a young woman before her her wedding um, and it was one of the very beautiful things that was in that was in our home that wasn't always the most beautiful place um, but when Shu showed me this I could not really make you believe what she had captured because you know the poets here probably maybe heard when I was reading that this was a little bit of a nod to a villanelle um with the repetitions of the of the word choice it's not a villanelle um it's just a sort of a gesture in that in that direction um and I wanted the poem to feel a little bit like a lullaby um 
I know I'm going to get emotional, but I wanted it to feel, to have a little bit of that dreamy lullaby like quality. Um, so that was what I was going for. And then when, when, she, when I opened up my computer and saw this piece of digital art that Shu had created, I could not believe it that she had captured a lullaby, this very dreamlike, um, surreal, soothing colors, um, you know, in dreams, things become other things, you know, in dreams, a face can be a mountain and a, mm -hmm. a, a fort can be a cloud like this is. So when I opened it, I saw that she had found the dreamlike quality in the poem um, that was there in my heart. And she had put it into a piece of visual art in a way that um, helped me see my poem eat even on a more deeper level. So I'm very grateful for that. Thank you, Shu, again, for doing that. I do know you after all, Trish. <laughs> <laughs> I I want to tell everybody who's on this call tonight that it it seems so far like they really, like everything just gelled and they would give each other something and the other person would create something that was perfect and wonderful. And if you stick around long enough, you're going to find that that wasn't always the case. <laughs> Um, we're going to talk about some other poems, but, um, now I want to move into Becca. Can, is it possible the, the longer document that Trish sent, can you put, um, can you put silver up where you can see the, the poem and the art together? I didn't get that document. So that is something. Trish can maybe hold it up. I will hold this up. So at the, um, uh, Lisa mentioned the exhibit. So at the library, the library has exhibited um, our work together, formatted by Shu. So this is what it looks like, formatted um, together, side by side. Yeah. Um, so, you know, th and this is, I should say, this is Shu's conception that that these are integrated, that these are, it, it, they're really not separate anymore, that that this is this is one piece of art so after the you know the exhibit the pieces on the exhibit uh she was done limited edition prints of them and the prints of this is this is the print because the art is not the poem or shoes art it's actually them together right um, all right so I, so I'll hold that good, good good i wanted them to see that before we went on to the next one because the next one is how to make a jade bonsai. And when Becca puts that up on the screen, you're gonna see that um, it is a concrete poem or um, a calligram, I think it's sometimes called. So um, Shu did not contribute art for this one. And I, I really want um, I really want Trish, Trish to read that poem. And then I wanna talk, uh, have, have you two talk about why why this poem is in the exhibit when there's none of Shu's art on the page. Oh, okay. And I want to thank um, Kajibi Lit uh, for first publishing this poem. So that's where that was first published. Um, How to make a jade bonsai. How to make a jade bonsai. Although I've watched the demonstrations I end up feeling sorry for the trees. They only want deep in their roots to be bushes sprawling free. Instead, they are wired in place, limbs stretched and bent back like a woman in bondage, a forced stillness. The bonsai master explains to me why it's all very beautiful. And I agree, there is something exquisite about the shapes we can twist a body into, the rigors of pain, and what unfolds within as we strip freedom away, embrace deprivation, and accept the thirst to be smaller. The scholar in my head chides, it isn't your task to speak this way, just leave the tree to its trainer, whose cuts signify love in ways you will never understand. Oh, oh thanks. 
this. It's a really, really touching poem. And knowing that this is on, this is framed alone, mm -hmm. right? Without art from shoe, but it is also art because of its form. Um, I would really like for you two to talk about why it was important to include this piece in this particular exhibit. Well, should I go first, Trish? This was, this was Shu, actually. I uh, She knew that this poem existed and had been published, and I'd shared it with her. Um, and she said it belonged in the exhibit. And I said, no, it doesn't belong in the exhibit because we're doing this exhibit together. Um, and she was very adamant. So I think, Shu, you should talk about why you were so adamant that this, this poem needed to be part of the exhibit. Um, and I should say, for those of you who can't go see the exhibit, not only did she make it part of the exhibit, but the central wall of the exhibit, she put it in the middle. <laughs> so you walk in and, it, and it's really like a, she made it almost like it was a crown jewel of the exhibit. And that was, that was all her. So Shu, why, why still? <laughs> well, why? I mean, to me, this piece is so strong, both visually and emotionally. With Without imagery, it doesn't mean that it's not strong visually. So what I love about it is so simple and, and bold. It, it actually has a perfect balance from my perspective. Um, so I'm aware that people have different interpretation of this poem. And for me, it is quite special. It's For me, it's about parenting. And then it has been a source of help and guidance. And you know, doing times when I actually need to let go and allow my children to be, you know, like, what do you say? Like the author of their own stories. So I think about a lot, even just even today, taking my son to the swimming class. I was like, you know, you do everything. I'm gonna be silent watching you because that's what, how to make a J bonsai <laughs> tells me to. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> you know, I've been I've been struck. You know, something that that Shu had said to me, and other people have said to me who've come to the exhibit. They say, um, "This is a poem that I had. I had." Some ideas in my head obviously about you know why I why I wrote it and what I was writing um and I had decided in some ways to, to actually stop sharing what was in my mind when I was writing it because I realized every now and then you're lucky enough to have a poem come to you um that different people are finding so many different things in and it belongs to the world it really doesn't belong to you anymore um, and I feel great gratitude that this is this seems to be one of those poems um, at the uh, a, a number of the people who, who've come to the exhibit have said what she said that this is such a beautiful poem about parenting. You know, it's a beautiful poem about what we do, what we do as parents and what we should do as parents um, and, you know, mistakes that we, we make. Um, and then a, a old professor of mine reached out. <laughs> You know, an old classics professor of mine reached out, said he'd seen this poem, and he really loved the way I had got to do his words, how I had really captured the tension between enlightenment ra rationalism and the natural world. It's like a little different than parenting. <laughs> <laughs> parenting, right? Um, you know, and and somebody else said this is this is one of the kindest poems I've ever read about depression and cutting um, and uh, you know and, and what it means when you when you go through a really hard hard time um, and I thought you know given that, that this is where the poem is is now what it's what it's become for people um, I am choosing not to say anymore where what the poem's origin is. So so you know nobody gets any any secret any secret nuggets about Jane Bonsai. You have to find what's there in it for yourself now. I think that's so interesting, especially since um, like Shu, you had a very visceral reaction to it, right? Like you talked about how strong it was and how 
just for you, like it was clear instantly, right? For you, it was about parenting. Yeah, uh, no doubt. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm curious, You, ha how many pieces are in the exhibit? Will you remind me? It's eight. There's eight, eight pieces. It's just eight pieces. And this is one of them. So yeah. seven pieces of art and eight poems. Yeah. So was that number, did the library say you have room for eight pieces? Is that how you came to that number? So basically, we look at this, okay. this is a visual problem. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, we looked at the space and then we see that was like the perfect fit. Okay. We want to make sure that they all have space to breathe so you can really absorb and read a poem. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious how you chose, how you chose which poems or which collaborations would be in the exhibit, right? Because this one looks like a tree which fits with the garden theme, but Shu, you really thought it was about parenting. So, and I know poem, right? Poems are not always what we think they're about and they're about different things to different people, but I think it's a good opportunity to talk about how you chose, which, you know, because Shu, you have, you're a prolific artist and Trish is a prolific poet. How did you choose what those eight pieces were gonna be? Well, I remember Shu, rejecting one <laughs> I do remember that too <laughs> you remember that I I you know I sent her some samples you know when we were when we were invited to 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 do this um we did start trading uh stuff back and forth you know I was like okay here are some poems that that I like or some poems that have been uh published fairly recently that that um you know that I have the the rights to again um what do you think are these any any that touch you um and not all of them worked, you know. So I I sent uh, I sent Shu one poem that she was like, yeah, that's not that's not going to be right for um for any for any work that I have or any um or and and actually I agreed with her, you know, it wasn't right for for on the library, you know. And then she sent me a, some some pieces that I was like, I just don't feel that with my with my book. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was I will say that was a really any poets on this call, any artists on this call who are working with each other, like you have to be really vulnerable to tell somebody no. Um, it, there's actually quite a lot of vulnerability in saying no, because I, I, you know, I want you to like everything I do. I'm sure she wants me to like everything I do. Um, and to, to create a close enough friendship where you can say to each other, that doesn't work with this piece or that doesn't work for my vision um is really it honestly I think it's very special because I think Lisa as you said earlier when we were starting it, it wasn't all just like a mutual love fest for every single piece um I mean mostly you know we, we have seen yeah. the same piece. I remember um, waking yeah. up a few mornings and I see like a, a novel like email from Trish, my daughter entered the room. Um, <laughs> okay, hey, Percy, I know you feel lonely. So I was received, can you close the door, please? Oh, okay. Can you close the door, please? Thank you. Um, <laughs> Percy had to make her entrance, right? Um, so I remember waking up in the morning and I received these emails from Trish. They were like a novel. Right to tell to really kind of explain to me why the piece the visual wasn't right for the poem, and I was just telling Trish she just say no, <laughs> but she's so kind, and I even told my husband I was like I think that I need to write longer emails to Trish <laughs> <laughs> because I was so I was so worried that we had this collaboration that was going really really well um and then she gave me um she gave me a piece and it's it's actually not one of the ones that we're doing tonight but she she gave me she she gave me a a piece of art and she's like how about matching this and I was like well I don't want to match that one with with this poem but I was terrified because I thought well what if this tanks our whole collaboration what if what if this hurts her feelings what if she thinks it's perfect so I did what I would 
do, what a writer would do is I was like, I, I'm like, I'm going to explain to her, you know, this long email about why, um, why this particular piece of art that she suggested to pair with the poem didn't work for me. And it wasn't personal. And I love the piece of art and I do love that piece of art, but uh, yeah, anyway, so you woke up to a novel and we're thinking like, why can't Trish just say no? You know? <laughs> Just say no, next. <laughs> that is so interesting about our personality and our approach to things because we're, we're so different. Yeah. But yeah, we work so well together. Yeah, yeah. That's really great. Um, I know that, so the next poem that we're going to talk about is Bronx, um, 1995. And I know that that was one shoe where you had, where you changed the art, right? Yes. Um, yeah. Before before we read and show the art, can you talk a little bit about that process and kind sure. of yeah how you yeah so for very Trish will be reading a poem so this poem it filled with like these like vibrant very physical descriptions um so I was sure that I want the visual I want to take more of an abstract approach um to really allow the viewer to have like room for interpretation or imaginations um so I try to use the same, same attempt as silver, trying to tap into my subconscious mind for a sign. It didn't work either. Um, so instead, what I did was I, um, I leveraged a piece that I have created in the past that shares very similar emotion and really expand on it. Um, yeah, and then I think that this was a hard piece for me. I really have to immerse myself mm -hmm. um, into the poem, almost like entering the poem um, as if I was Trish to really feel from her perspective. Um, so later on, you guys can see, I end up creating something very abstract, but it conveys a sense of distance and mystery. Um, mm -hmm. What was that like for you, Trish, of seeing art that just didn't fit the well this piece actually she did something very generous with this with the next piece with the next visual that you're going to see so this piece um bronx 1995 it had already been published it was published in chautauqua um and i was thinking it would be so lovely to have art for it so she showed me some some things that she thought might work and the piece that she showed me really had, you know, you're saying she, the emotional resonance, there was this, the emotional quality was the emotion behind the poem. I, which is this, something that visual artists do that I just, I personally am in awe of that you look at a piece, a piece of visual art and it evokes this emotion in you. Um, I saw the art, it evoked the same emotion of the poem, but her original piece was all in shades of like blues and purples and and the, I think both of us felt like this piece, our pieces work, we're speaking to the same emotion from the same heart place, I guess. Um, but the poem Bronx 1995, it does have so many color images in it that the color was wrong. Um, not wrong. I mean, it was perfect for what she was going to say, but Shu, Shu did this thing that was so incredibly generous. She said, let me go back and rework the color palette in this piece because it's a digital piece and I can do that. And I will spend time with the concept just translating this concept into the color palette that works with the colors that are mentioned in your poem. And then they'll resonate visually and emotionally together. And I, I have to say, I was really blown away that somebody would be willing to do that to um, a piece of art that had already been completed, you know, to go back and, and change it that way um, in order to create what is a new piece of art. And I, like you, Shu, I really think, I don't think of this as a separate poem from this from this piece of art, any visual anymore. I mean, we're, we're putting them up on the screen and we're talking about them as if they're separate, but it's one new piece now for, for me. Yeah, 
Becca, when you show the visual, were you able to show like visual and the words together? Do you have a layout page? Because I think that's a lot more impactful if you have it. Trish would have to hold that up. Okay. Um, somebody bought it, so I don't have one to <laughs> hold up. Um, but you know what? If you drop the link to Shu's website mm -hmm. um, in the, the chat or someplace, it's uh, in a garden of small dreams. It'll take you to Shu's website. If you click on in a garden of small dreams, you'll see all eight pieces of the um, that that were in the exhibit. Um, so she with the poem and the visual side by side. Trish, do you want to go? We have it up just the visual on screen. Do you want to go ahead and read Bronx 1995? Oh, okay, I will. OK, so this is uh, Bronx. Bronx 1995. Um, I wrote this when I was a graduate student. <laughs> I was getting my PhD in philosophy and living in the Bronx and kind of learning what it's like to be in the city. Um, okay. Bronx, 1995. The Bronx is like this. Stray things show up at the door. Menus, Mormons, someone else's morning paper. And now an insistent cat circling the stairwell, demands echoing on cracked marble, tail an erect counterpoint to dirty paws. It's like this everywhere, even in Missouri, where I was born. Does everyone know how these things end? Feline in the apartment, on the bed, on the couch, Fall light slants through the window to warm him, turns his whiskers golden. Shadows lace in, too, from the fire escape, where sparrows crowd over stale baguettes, hopping like brown leaves tossed in the wind. In this late light, the cat's fur under my fingers is soft and rich, and I know the color but cannot name it. Butternut, I say. Honey, ripe wheat. All things I moved here to get away from. Beyond the fire escape, beyond the traffic, miles beyond my mother in her flat wide yard uses suet to bring the birds to her. She sends me pictures in which they are small, small specks and the surrounding fields swallow them up, resolute and golden. She won't visit me, but when the phone rings, she answers and her voice is warm and soft. Champagne, she says, the word a small gift offered across a line that hisses like wind in cornfields. The color of your cat is champagne. Hmm. I just kind of want to sit with that for a second. It's so beautiful. Well, thank you. So we talked, um, that was one where, where Shu did a lot of revision and revisioning and rethinking. Um, but there was also one where Trish, you had to you had to do a lot of revision, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Shu, I, I, Shu did all of this re revising to this to this piece of art that she'd made, and I, I have no idea. I don't know how artists do it, but like I, that visual looks like champagne to me. I can't even. She captured everything in it. I there's some magic to digital art that I don't know, but Shu did it. Um, um, champagne is really the kind of the anchor um, for the overall look and feel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that last line. Mm -hmm. I do too. That last line is, is a good last line. Um, but, you know, so I put, I put she through her paces on that one, but she put me through my paces on another, on another one. Um, I think the last, well, one of the, one of the last ones that we'll talk about, I guess, is, is uh, one called Still Life. Um, I'm looking around here to see if I have, I do have that one. No one's, no one's blocked that one. 
Um, we're giving you a gift. That one is <laughs> very special. It's just gonna be very special. Um, but I, I want, I, I want to hold up just the 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 piece together. So this is it together. I'm gonna try to hold it to the. So this is a print of it. Have I? So that's what it looks like. Okay. Um, And this How one, we talk about this one, too. <laughs> we read it first, or should we start talking about it first? What do you think? Okay. You want me to start? Well, I told uh, you should. <laughs> I told you that I was writing. Um, that I was writing a poem about irises. <laughs> um, because uh, I wanted. To, I wanted to write this this poem for. Um, for my mother-in-law who, who had just passed away. She just passed away last year. Um, a few days ago was actually the anniversary of her funeral. So this, this poem is actually a harder one for me to read because that is very fresh. Um, but, uh, but I let you know that I was working on this, this poem um, that I wanted to include in the exhibit. Um, if I could finish it, if she could come up with appropriate art for it. Um, and I said, well, it's about, it's about irises. It's about irises and my, in my mother-in-law's yard, you know, the irises came up and they're really, they're really pretty and it really moved me. So I'm writing this, I'm working on this poem about irises and I'll send you some drafts and maybe that'll give you enough to start with and you can start on some art and I'll keep working on the poem and, and something nice will come together. So I don't know if you, you should take yeah. it. Yeah, so Trish actually told me that she never worked this way. She had never handed a draft of poem to anyone. Of course, working with a shoe, you're always on the time, a deadline. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. um. She told me this poem for is for her mother-in-law. It's named Iris. The title is Iris. So I kind of want to stay ahead of the game. So I started doing this exploration of irises. I looked into um, um, Trish mother-in-law's um, garden pictures of them. I even took um, walks within Upper my hand to just look for irises to get some inspirations. So um, yeah, and one day Trisha and I was brainstorming on this piece and she told me, you know, Shu, it's not, this poem is not really about irises, you know? And I was like, what? <laughs> so, <laughs> so we decided not to, we decided we didn't want to create a literal translation of the poem. Uh, we want much more than that. So we ended up selecting a piece from the existing work that I have that seem to fit um, the vibe of, um, you know, fit, fit the, um, the vibe just right. Um, so this entire process was not easy for me either, Trish. So it really taught me the importance of being flexible and open-minded because mm -hmm. I really had a strong desire that I want to create or I want to create an original piece for this work. Like I, 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 I love the poem. Um, but sometimes you just need to reset your um, expectation and go with what's right uh, for the for the project. There are no irises in here. No, no. There iris. are no irises in there. You are this really and you'll see them pushing again. the boundary. There's no irises in there. <laughs> There's no irises in there. Um, yes, I and I, so, yeah. I oh, you froze. I Oh, okay. I think it would be, I think it would be really great if we could put the art up and have you read the poem oh. and then talk about like your revision, that whole journey that you went on by in revising this poem. Oh, sure. Okay. Let me find, let me find that one. Um, okay. So the poem, I think we've already given away that it is not called Irises. Um, this poem is called Still Life, um, and it's dedicated to um, my partner, Chuck. This is his mother. Um, okay, so it's for her. Bear with me on this one, everybody. Still Life. We walk your mother's garden, and you whisper, the irises don't know she's gone. 
this decades old collection blooms madly. Dusty purples, sharp yellows, wine velvets rising of their own accord. The tallest blooms uncoordinated cries of color along the back of the house. Indomitable, each blossom an intricate double curl of petals and stamens bigger than my own two hands cupped. Green leaves at their bases like flat swords spiking upright, slicing the ground to make way for stalks, color crowned, frilled and glowing, half translucent in the summer light they've erupted from these beds to worship. The blind earth won't cease these offerings. Last month, we cut daffodils for the grave. A pale lilac bloomed too for Scythia, crocus, perfume drifting across the lawn and spent petals raining in spring storms. Now birds swoop, frustrated by the dry bird bath, the empty feeders. They dart among untended rhubarb stalks, thick ruby shoots pushing up determinedly, fierce and tart in a haphazard jumble topped by poison leaves. I fill the bird bath, pull up a stray oak sapling, stand barefoot in the grass. The threat of frost has passed. We hang her spider plants and philodendrons on the porch again we don't know what else to do, so we do what she did, as if in a dream. A breeze drifts through their leaves, and the pots lightly turn and sway. I step forward, gently snip cuttings for each of us, set them in glass bases, hope they will root. It's an aside, Trish, but I think you should teach a class on um, endings. Your ending is oh. beautiful. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, I want to give you a moment to just catch your breath because I know that that's a difficult one to read. That um, is a difficult one, yeah. Yeah. So what I'll say while you catch your breath is that, Shu, you said that there are no irises in that artwork, but I see the colors of, of the irises that I know from my childhood in that artwork and the purples and the, the cool tones. And I think that's a very cool kind of nod to maybe what it started out as, maybe not as what it ended up to be. And I, you know, I wouldn't know that as a viewer, unless I had heard you talk about it, but it's still, um, you know, Trish talked earlier about your art and how some of those words are hidden and can't see them. I think I think the colors that you chose for this art um, nod to that as well, which is really cool. This, um, this art of shoes captures abundance so yeah. well. Um, and I, you know, I think again, many people who are, are grieving are a little startled that the world keeps going on, <laughs> you know, the, that there's, that there's so much abundance and beauty and, you know, the plants keep blooming and looking gorgeous and you, you think doesn't doesn't the world know that everything has stopped mm -hmm. um and I think that she's art for this one just captures that overflowing explosive abundance that that almost feels momentarily rude in the face of someone who is who is uh grieving and then if you sit with it is a comfort eventually you know it's 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 a little bit of both and I, I I love the way she this piece of art really captures all of those those things you know there's um there's I keep looking at it. you see me keep looking down I keep looking down at it I like that there's this kind of darkness at its depth you mm -hmm. know there's abundance in the front um in the foreground I should say I should use the proper art term she's teaching me there's this, <laughs> this abundance in the in the foreground but there is this 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 darkness in the, in the back that's that's mm -hmm. so 
perfect really for this particular poem. Um, but <laughs> I'm talking about this poem as if I wrote it and then this art was perfect for it. Actually, this is this is one that that shoe made me change. <laughs> Quite a bit, right? Yes, she made me change a poem. Um, so we, uh, th this was probably the most collaborative one, I would say, that, that we did. So I, I had told her that I was writing this poem, and she was busily researching irises, unbeknownst to me. Um, until I said, well, shoo, it's not about irises. It's, it's really a poem about grief, you know. Um, <laughs> she's like, what? What? How have I been doing this? So I did something that I, that I don't usually do with, um, I would say, like civilians, you know, like non-poets or non-writers don't get to see my work in draft you know, like maybe some writers that I trust or some fellow poets that I trust, but like I decided to take the leap and show Shu drafts of this poem as I was writing it. And I showed her, I showed her an initial draft. Um, and I get this, I get this message back, very short, very concise, because she was short and concise and she says it's too long. too long that's it <laughs> so, what and, and in fairness I I should clarify it was a multi-part poem it was like you know it was it was it was a three-parter guys you know it was <laughs> and she was just like it's too long it won't work with the the art you really have to um go back revise um so and I, I don't I don't want to interrupt, but just so that people know, when 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 we say too long, was it like five lines too long? Was it double what it needed to be? Tell, let them know kind of how, what that, <laughs> how long is too long, right? Multiple. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> so I was, I was, I didn't know. We were we were both navigating on what is the best way to work with each other. So how I expressed to Trish that's too long, I laid it out for her to see here the words are off the page. <laughs> this There's is not the way that I communicate with her through visuals. Like it's a little bit too long, you see. <laughs> um. So the first, yeah, the first note she said it's too long, and she said, "Well, I mean." Trish, you do understand it, it it needs to fit on one page beside the art. Um, and I thought, okay, I can make it shorter. I'll use just one of the one of the pieces. I for the poets in the in the crowd here, it was it was a three part poem. And I was like, there's one part that's that's really the core, that's the emotional core of this particular thing that I want to say. So I'll pull that part out. That will be, I will make that the poem. Uh, I reworked it. I sent it back. Sent it to Shu. She was like, it's still too long, Trish. Don't you? <laughs> it has to fit on the page, you know? So um, I was, this, so this to me was really, this was a very new thing for me to work this way you know I just I write what I want to write as long as I want to write it um it's done sort of like when I say it's done and it's done when I'm satisfied with it so to have this this collaborative process with somebody giving me feedback as I'm as I'm writing not like a workshop to you know, help make your poem grow in all the ways it needs to grow, but but a collaboration to change to work with somebody else. Um, and I will say doing this has made me a better poet. It really has. Any poets watching this, find yourself an artist and let them push you because I got better because of the way she pushed me. I will always be grateful for that. Um, but I did, um, if you go and look at the poem later, you'll see I reworked it into tersets, not to get too technical, you know, but I made, I made it into tersets. Um, I combined some lines so it worked with that terset structure. I kept checking to see, does it fit on the page? Um, 
And then the, so I sent it and she approved of it. And the very last thing, the very last note was like, well, the title can't be irises. <laughs> Which she was right. There are, no irises. <laughs> there are no irises. So you have to change the title. It can't be, it can't be irises. Um, so that was yet another note I had to, I had to incorporate. <laughs> um, and she was right. She was totally right. So I slept on it and I was thinking of pulling out, you know, sometimes you title a poem uh, by pulling out the, the strongest line. For me, you know, the emotional core of that poem was the blind earth won't cease these offerings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for and, and it, it occurs right about the poem center and it felt like the core. And I was like, what if we call it the blind earth? Um, and because Chu and I had been working together for so long at that point and really trusted each other, she's like, I don't really like that. I mean, if you I like it. Feel it. You know, <laughs> I'm white. Didn't feel I'll live, right. I'll live, you know. Um, so we were able to talk to each other that way at this point, because this was the last piece really that we collaborated on and, and the process of doing this. And had enabled us to to talk this way to each other and she was like I mean that's okay I guess I mean yeah. <laughs> you know. um so I slept on it and um you know kind of kind of like she was saying you know you sleep on it and hope that something will come um I let the committee of sleep work on it and when I woke up in the morning I said ah still life that's the title for this poem it's it's a nod to artists you know that's what they do you know artists traditionally study doing still life um and this poem is very descriptive um so i'm doing with words what uh what she would do with her digital palette um but also in the face of grief there is still life so there was this double meaning um, that felt really right and felt really rich. So it's still life and it's about their life going on um, mm -hmm. in the face of grief. And I said, Shu, what do you think of still life? And she's like, ah, bingo, we got it. We got it. So um, <laughs> she made me better on that. Um, she made this poem better. She made the title better. This this poem is a better poem all around because- You wrote the poem. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if she gets you as an editor. <laughs> it sounds like she kind of knows what she's talking about with poetry. She, are you sure you don't want to add that to your stable of talents? Yeah. I don't know. This part I'm a little insecure about. I'll work on it. <laughs> I'll work on it. Okay. <laughs> we'll check back with you at some point. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I want to say again, I want to sing she's praises just a little bit more. This the the exhibit curator at the New York Public Library is Hamilton Grange Branch. Um was so drawn to this piece that he made it the he made it the piece that's on all of the promo materials. Um, so the promo materials don't have my poetry on them. They have this this piece of art that is kind of the advertisement for the exhibit. So um, it, it's really a glorious piece. I wish you could all see it in person. Yeah, it really is beautiful. Um, and hopefully all of you will go to Shu's website and you'll be able to see it uh, better and better color and, and you'll be able to spend some time with it on your own, which I think is important to do. It keeps giving as you look at this. This piece. It really does. I, I was looking at it again while you were reading and I thought, I thought this piece is so, you know how we talk about air in like a poem needs to breathe, right? I was like, there's, there's very little air in that in that artwork and I think that's why it seems so lush and so um abundant because there's yeah. you know if you compare it to Daphne where there's a lot of air right or silver yeah. I mean um there's a lot of yeah. air in that piece so I think that's I find that really really interesting yeah. um believe it or not we are coming up on our last few minutes um so if there's anything that that you or Shu would like to say that you haven't been able to say yet. Now is the time. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna ask if you'll read Daphne for us before we give some closing remarks. Um, oh, okay. Shu, is there anything you wanted to add that we haven't talked about yet? 
No, I think we talked about a lot, but I really <laughs> want to know um, <laughs> that what makes this collaboration so successful is, um, I, I think that Trish and I are mutual kind of care and respect for each other. Um, and, you know, throughout this process, we really, um, you know, have each other's best interests in mind, which, mm-hmm. you know, which is a nice feeling. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a great feeling. And I, I love Lisa, I will say, I love that you mentioned that there was so little air in that, in in her, um, in this gorgeous piece that I can't stop holding up. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if, if you go read the poem, you will see that I, I deliberately, I, you know, I created the first portion of the poem actually has no air. It, it is one, it is one um, long sentence so you would you would actually lose your breath if you tried to read the whole thing uh in one sentence um as it's written and this her art is just so perfect for that okay so I'll read Daphne I know you want me to read Daphne but I can't no I know it's hard when we get to the end but um I think Becca's going to put that art up on the screen and then whenever you're ready to read I think that's a great poem to close with okay I'm waiting to see the, I'm waiting to see shoes art. Okay. (laughs) There we go. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Daphne. My failing eyesight makes everything a metaphor. Things become other things, shade and water, spore and snow. The deer is a fallen log, the falling leaf, a sparrow alighting on that log. Only what is close is clear. I look up and my world blurs, gray rocks, silver haunches of raccoons, a whole family sitting backs to me. Waxwing flock leaves in an updraft. I can't tell in this transfigured world and I wonder, at 52, does this make me a better poet? Yesterday, walking, I gazed into the still forest and saw only trees until the doe standing there moved. In the moment before it became a doe, it was a tree, wanted to be a tree, like the girls in some myths who run from gods while begging others to help them. My dear transformed the other way from a still thing to one with a heartbeat. Oh, thanks guys. I think that's a beautiful, I think that's a beautiful way to end. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Becca, do you want me to close it out or do you want to go ahead and do that? I can, I'd I'd love to close this out if that's possible. First, I want to thank everyone for coming and invite you to unmute yourself at this point to give a round of applause or or say hello. Um, If that's, if folks are still... (laughs) There. That's a quiet group tonight. Yes, yes, I know. I see some. I see some clapping. That's wonderful. I love and you. hearts. Okay. Love it. Love it. Um, so, again, I just want to say um, that we've shared your links, including the information about the current exhibit, which runs through mm-hmm. September fifteenth, in the chat, and we've also shared Shu's website. Um, and social media. So folks, please go to this exhibit, purchase the art. Um, and of course, please follow us on social media if you get the chance. Um, I put our mailing list in the chat. We don't uh, spam people. We have very um, <laughs> decent mail flow. So we encourage you to sign up. Um, and with that, I will say thanks so much to our guests. Trish and Shoots. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. I'm really um, excited to try more of these kinds of conversations going forward. Um, And I thank you for your time.
Thank you so much. It's been really Thank wonderful. You. We were honored to be asked to be here. This has been terrific. It's a dream. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Hello. Good night.